Hello, welcome to the Limitless Energy Podcast. And today we are in Anaheim, California at the NAM Show, the National Association of Music Merchants. And we are taking this opportunity to speak with Brian Rothschild and Jeff Sobel of the John Lennon Educational Tour Bus. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation, and I'm so happy to have them on. Brian and Jeff, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. We are on the Lennon bus, and this is so exciting for me personally. Um, so I really do want to learn a little bit first about the history of the bus. So maybe I'll start with you, Brian. How did how did this get started? Whose brainchild was it? And uh, tell me the story. Okay. Well, this was um, an idea that I had um, that grew out of... Uh, my background with a music management company that was um, started by David Sonnenberg and we represented many many artists including the Black Eyed Peas and the Fugees and Joan Osborne and in uh, that capacity we received a lot of unsolicited music from people who would see the company name on the liner notes and always talked about starting a songwriting contest that would give folks around the world op opportunity and access to the business, which as we know, you know, can be super tight knit and difficult right. for people to break into. So, so bands were sending you their demos and hoping to exactly to get a record just deal randomly, you know, mm -hmm. like you need to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, but there were a lot. So we just always would talk about starting something like that, that would give access um, and had the opportunity to work with Wyclef from the Fugees and he was looking for the rights to uh, use a sample of John Lennon's song and I was tasked with reaching out to Yoko's attorney to see if maybe that sample would be <clears throat> licensed and the first thing he said really was like that that's not going to happen but um, I will check and then I got word back that um, she wanted to meet about it which mm -hmm. seemed very, very surprising to me. So I had the opportunity, um, was very nervous to go to their apartment. They, Yoko was living there. Um, this is where she lived with John. Um, Wait, which apartment? In, in New it's York? Called, yeah, it's called the Dakota. The Dakota it's quite yeah. a storied building yeah. in, in New York City on the Upper West Side. And it was also very obviously, sadly, where John was murdered. Um, and she never moved, and uh, she and Sean you know, well, they continue to, to own it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I went there, uh, couldn't believe I was in the Dakota, came into the kitchen, sat down, had the chance to play the little sample piece. Um, not much response uh, at that point. And then I just kind of blurted out in my awkwardness that we'd been thinking of a songwriting contest idea. And, you know, what did she think of maybe using John's name calling it the John Lennon songwriting contest. <laughs> was this and just to b break the awkwardness? Yes, 100%. <laughs> I was very, very, it was like, you know, I'd only been there for one minute after I pushed play. And then it was 100% to break the, the awkwardness. It wasn't really something that I had planned to. Was it just you just and sit. Yoko yeah, at the table? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, it was tea. And, you know, it, it didn't get any less awkward at that moment either. <laughs> and then, you know, two, three minutes later, then I was gone. And then the next day I got a, you know, I, somebody buzzed me up and said that Yoko Ono was on the phone. And, and I thought they were totally, you know, punking me because I had talked about what had happened the day before. <laughs> and there was no way that, but it was her. And she called and said two things. The first, um, no. You're not sampling the sample. song. <laughs> um, but the other idea I like, and that was the beginning of my conversation with Yoko. And we so we launched the John Lennon Songwriting Contest in 1997, which is still running. It's in its 27th year now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's an international songwriting contest in 12 categories, um, rock and pop and jazz and hip hop and country and children's music. It, and um, it has a big prize package that's made possible by um, all of our sponsors, you know, most of which are involved in the Lennon bus as well. But anyway, as I was getting that up on its feet, I had the thought to put a mobile recording studio together that would promote the contest for the spring of that year. It was meant to just be a springtime 
promotion and that was it. And um, I got uh, Yamaha Corporation involved with it and Maxell Corporation were the two first sponsors. And were these through your management connections or through Yoko's connections? They were not through these? Yoko's connections, no. The initial idea was that, you know, this was a, a licensing agreement, mm-hmm. um, you know, where um, we had the rights to use the name and the Imagine face that's here. That's the self-portrait that John did of himself in 1968 mm-hmm. that is so famous. It was a cover of the Imagine album. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, anyway, the the first Lennon bus then premiered on Good Morning America. Um, with Wyclef, who did not hold a grudge about that other thing, and Joan Osborne, the singer. And the idea was that in the course of the two hours of that live morning show, um, they were going to create something original and then present it. It it was really, in that sense, um, well ahead of its time. There was no reality TV, really. There was nothing quite like that. And But as a last minute thought, we put uh, some New York City public school students on board with them. And that really became the model for what we frequently do with students so they come on in the morning um, and they create something original they'll write an original song and at the end of that two hour good morning america they presented this song that that joan sang and we got a lot of positive feedback um, from the mayor of of boston and lots of educators and you know i was uh I was kind of smitten at that point with the idea of it. So it, it for the time, it looked really good. The studio really looked good, um, but it had a lot of problems. You know, it it looked a lot better than uh, it worked. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, part of that was because we, you know, were working with people who were used to building studios, but they weren't used to building studios that were in a mobile situation. So it was the beginning of a learning curve. But the the real thing of it was that. Having put it together and, you know, as clunky as it was, um, it was still pretty great. And people thought it was am- amazing. And um, I couldn't imagine taking it apart. That was the original thought mm-hmm. was, we'll do this for like, you know, 10 weeks and then we'll dismantle it and, and move on. So I couldn't, I couldn't imagine doing that. And really, it's been a labor of love from that point, you know, to this of uh, keeping it alive, bringing in partners. Um, that believed in the mission, which is providing young people with free opportunities to create music. And eventually um, we added video into that as well. So the the projects that students are producing are audio and video projects that reflect their ideas and their concerns. And, um, you know, as the technology evolved, we were, were able to keep upgrading it. Um, moved into another bus in 2008. Um, and so we've continued to do significant upgrades through, uh, through the years. Sure. Apple came on as a sponsor. Um, do, we, do I remember what year it was exactly? I mean, it's certainly 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. 2004 was the launch of the bus with Apple as a sponsor. Okay. So, um, you know, many people may know that Steve Jobs was a big, big Beatles fan. He was particularly enamored of John Lennon. Mm-hmm. Um, Hence the name Apple. Exactly. Um, so we were fortunate that when he found out about the bus, it's something that he gave his approval to. Um, and we were able to put the Apple on the side of the bus, mm-hmm. um, which originally his Marcom people were unaware of. So when they started seeing that, there was a lot of, why, you know, we don't do that. We don't sponsor things like that. Why is the Apple mark on on the bus? And then they found out that Steve had approved it. So Personally. we kind of, yeah. So we, we, you know, have honestly with John Lennon's name on it, there's so much positive, um, th- there's so much positive feeling uh, about John for so many people in so many different industries. Um, from so many walks of life, from so many perspectives, um, that, you know, that is certainly one of the reasons that, you know, it, I, you know, we know it's the greatest mobile recording studio in the world, but the extra special sauce is that it's got John's name on it and yeah, it's something absolutely. that Yoko is. People want to be involved. Yeah. I mean, we want to be involved. But so, yeah, yeah, let's talk about the, it started from this, I mean, you described it as something that looked great, but didn't sound as, as good as it looked. 
and turned into something pretty state of the art. So, um, Jeff, you came aboard a couple years into the the uh, after the incarnation of the bus, and can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the bells and whistles and the toys that are on the on the bus now? Yeah, like Brian said, the bus started in 1998, and I got involved at the beginning of 2002. Um, and at the time, um, you know, it was a lot of hardware, um, which was pretty standard for the time. Um, but we were working with digital tape um, and digital consoles, and it was. Um, you know, it was a very functional studio in a lot of ways, um, but not fully state of the art as far as what the high, the best. Mm -hmm. you know, what about in terms of the, were. the audio engineering, not not the electronics, but the mm -hmm. audio, uh, uh, in terms of having the space sound good. Yeah, well, uh, we're in the second iteration of the bus right now. Like as Brian said, we had a, an original bus that ran uh, through two thousand seven. The layouts are kind of similar. Um, but they were oriented differently, mm -hmm. and um, we had a, a rear studio that was kind of in the lounge area, uh, what would normally be the lounge area of, of a tour bus, um, and um, it was a good sounding room. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as the as the years progressed and you got more and more sponsors, who identified the toys that you wanted? That was me. They, that was so. You were the one that yeah. kind of saw something. You're like, I have to have that. Yeah, exactly. Can so, you can you uh, point out some notable things? Yeah. Um, so starting with you know the digital tape systems that we had when you know we very thankfully got Apple on board. Uh, mm -hmm. I recognized that that was the opportunity for a real paradigm shift in the way the studios were set up, and we were going to move into nonlinear editing, um, which was essential. So we brought on Apple computers. Um, and hardware from Avid so that we could run Pro Tools, which is the industry standard at the time, um, kind of still is, and uh, really set it up so that when you walked on board the Lennon bus, you were using the same gear that you would use if you walked on into any recording studio that, you know, at a, a professional rate. Mm -hmm. That's, this is a, this is a setup now that is relatively well known in the industry. I mean, you have, people coming on to record here, right? Yeah, we um, we like to have studios that any artist, you know, the, the best artists in the world who are used to the best studios in the world can walk in here and say, this place is amazing. This is all of the gear that I'm already familiar with. These are industry standard solutions. The workflows are solid. Uh, and the quality is 100% the same as you would get in any recording studio in the world. So what an opportunity for a child, someone who's, who's just learning and, and wants to, you know, to, to be exposed to something like this. Can, can you talk a little bit about some of the notable tours this bus has, has been on, or one of the no, notable stops? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many. I mean, most recently, we were on tour with Wu-Tang Clan. Since we put in this Dolby Atmos uh, mix room, um, and I had uh, met Riza some years ago. He'd done some other projects with us and always wanted to have the bus out on the road with them. So we, we went out um, on their Canadian and US dates. He recently had recorded um, a really beautiful new piece of work called a Ballet Through Mud that he recorded with the Colorado Symphony Orchestra. It's very romantic. There's nothing hip hop about it, actually. So people are very surprised when they hear it that it's from him. But um, he wanted to do Atmos mixes while we were out on the road. So um, we brought Pietro Rossi, um, who was uh, originally our engineer on Lennon Bus Europe, because there's another bus over in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, he's become quite an accomplished uh, audio engineer and mixer. And so we brought him in and while traveling, um, and Jeff was on board too, they did these, for us, were our first Atmos mixes of uh, this incredible new work that he's going to release you know, next month. Um, prior to that, we were out with Machine Gun Kelly. Um, he used the bus to create a lot of his new material that's out now. Also used it as a, um, a hub for editing uh, video content that became part of the documentary that was being shot uh, about him. Um, I mean, the Black Eyed Peas did a lot of their songs on board the bus. That became the, their biggest hits. Let's Get It Started 
was recorded first on board the John Lennon Educational Tour Bus. It was the previous iteration of the of the Lennon Bus, um, but that's been, I think, one of the, the hallmarks of it is for artists to be able to do high quality work while they're out on the road, especially when they're at that point in their careers where everybody's pressuring them and wanting them to come out with the next thing while they're also touring. Um, but the other piece of it that's important is that in most cases, COVID notwithstanding, because of COVID, we certainly had to change some things around. But um, you know, typically, if we're out with an artist like that, we're also hosting students. So we're going from venue to venue, and we're hosting students from local public schools or community centers who are coming on board the bus to do, you know, our usual work, which is creating something original with those students, and um, often having members of the band or the artists themselves coming in at some point during the day to listen down or to put something of their own onto the track, whether it's a, a vocal or a riff of some sort. Um, and in those settings, it's also fulfilling another objective of the bus, which is providing kids with um, a glimpse into career opportunities that are in allied fields, right? So um, many of them just think of the star in the center of the stage and don't realize that there are jobs and careers that are in those allied fields that they could be a part of. Mm -hmm. So the bus introduces kids to that. And they also will sometimes get to go backstage. They'll see what it takes to produce a live show. And just one other thing, as we were talking about, like having this be a studio that, um, you know, any artist who's used to the best studios in the world could come into, like for us having students, um, and we go to a lot of underserved communities. We spend a lot of time going to places where people don't necessarily present the kids with the best that the world has to offer. And having them come into an environment like this and knowing that it's was was really built for them. This this wasn't built for those celebrity artists. You know, we take advantage of that, and it's good for the program and for our partners that we can get that support. But it's really for the students, mm -hmm. um, and for them to see that people care enough that they want them to be exposed to the the latest and the greatest and the best that the industry has to offer because they deserve it. And we get a lot of press coverage because the bus is so super cool. Um, it's, you know, of course I feel it's like unlike anything in the world, but so from a press perspective and with John's name on it, it's a pretty easy sell to get, um, you know, local and national press to come in and cover it. But for kids to be the subject of positive stories in their communities is sadly, you know, not very common. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the other piece of it. Like we, we really like being able to be a good news segment that features students that are in those communities. So you've been doing this for a couple of decades now. Are there any uh, interesting stories about kids that either exhibited incredible talent or that actually did decide to go in the industry or even, you know, work in, in here or in some other, uh, you know, partners that you work with? Yeah, I mean, we, we Apple certainly... Or Dolby or something. Yeah, I mean, we certainly hear about those kinds of stories. I mean, my, one of my favorites is something that started like 20 years ago with um, a, a student that came on board that stayed in touch with Jeff. Um, did you want to talk about her for a moment? Yeah, her mom stayed in touch with me. Okay. Um, and she did as well. She came on board and she had a lot of talent, um, but it, not a lot of confidence around it. And, um, you know, as, you know, a high school student, you know, wanting to pursue music and careers in music, but not having a lot of confidence in it and not a lot of external support around it either. Like she was kind of trying to convince her mom that this was, you know, something that she could do. And of course, her mom wanted her to go to medical school um, reasonably. And uh, but she, you know, didn't just have talent, but she was sometimes in the course of collaborating to write a song, one of the students will kind of show kind of leadership abilities and kind of take on the songwriting, you know, um, driving, driving it and really, you know, helping the other students achieve like what they're trying to do. So we could see that that was happening in this case. And her mom came by later in the afternoon and asked how it was going. And I, I told her like, well, your, your daughter actually is leading the songwriting 
um, project in there and is really talented. And she was like, oh, you know, we've really been considering whether or not she should pursue this, but, you know, it's so risky. Um, so I said, you know, she really is, is showing that she has something special, so something you should really seriously consider. So they took that more seriously following that, and she wound up going to a, a Berkeley School of Music summer camp and doing really well there, and then getting, being admitted and going through Berkeley, and um, now she's a, a professional artist, and um, her mom still writes me every time she releases a new album or something like that, because she's so proud of what her daughter has done, and really attributes it to that day on the bus. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, there's not enough of these types of projects around, and uh, that's what I think is so special about this this project. And you know, congrats to you. It was your brainchild, uh, <laughs> you know, and you, you met the right folks and and got it, it got it happening. Um, I just want to say, like I said, from a personal level, it it's so exciting for me to be involved with with anything with John Lennon's name on it. Um, but the the notion of providing the power for the bus, providing the, the electricity um, and to, to power the studio here. Um, you know, I know this is, this is relatively new now. Um, we've been doing it on, on, you know, RVs and motorhomes and stuff for, for a little while now, for al you know, almost a decade. Uh, but to apply it to an application like this, which is so unique, is is exciting just because of what the bus is but also because of the application um can you talk a little bit about how the power system might have changed the way you have done things in the past yeah it's a huge upgrade for us uh, and something we've been wanting to do for a long time so thank you for making this dream a reality um you know, we could talk about the specifics of the technology, but I think that one of the really important things to understand is one of my responsibilities is training our crew, you know, how to use the studios, how to, you know, lead the students to their, their projects. Um, and one of the things that I train them on um, a lot is the power system because, you know, monitoring and managing that is a big part of, you know, making the bus functional. Um, and so any of them, you know, who have previously been working on the bus will tell you that um, it's a, they have to reserve a part of their brain dedicated to thinking about the power system with the old system because um, it had a very short battery life. Um, we have an onboard generator, so the bus is fully functional anywhere you want to work, um, but obviously generators are loud. Um, which is not great in a recording studio. studio. They yeah. vibrate, they annoy the neighbors. Yeah. So we want to minimize that. And during critical recording of vocals, you know, you, you just can't use them. With our old battery system, we could get maybe an hour or two of runtime. So they had to use that really judiciously and think about it all day long. Like, when do I need to run the generator? When do I, when can I afford to use the batteries in order to get this critical recording done? And, and if they didn't manage it correctly, they would get into a bind where they would have more recording to do, but not enough battery life to get it done correctly. So while they're doing so many things, you know, leading a group of students through a, a creative project, running a recording session, producing a song, engineering it, all of the things, they're also having to think very seriously about the power system. Um, with the upgrade that we've done with Battleborn batteries now, that's eliminated, and they no longer have to think about the power system because the battery runtime is basically all day. So they can just show up with fully charged batteries in the morning, work all day, not ever think about how they're going to manage the power because it's going to last. Um, and even when they do have to think about the power, you know, just to check in occasionally, it's so much easier now. With the old system, there was no smart display of any kind. They had to go and look at a voltage reading on the battery bank and interpret what the char battery state of charge from that was, um, which is not an exact science and riddled with anxiety because of it. Um, so they never really knew. And with the old lead acid batteries, if you went below 50% state of charge, which again is very hard to even guess at when you're even close to it, you would damage the batteries permanently, um, which is a huge expense. Um, so. Now we you know, have batteries that have all day runtime. We have a display prominently in the front studio that shows an exact state of charge, so they always know what it is. Um, and they can run the batteries, you know, not just to 50%, but all the way down um, and really utilize the full potential of the battery bank. Um, so the technology is amazing, but like what it alleviates psychologically on already overburdened engineers and educators is, uh, I think, really one of the biggest benefits. Love to hear it. 
that's you know preaching to the choir there, of course. But you know, I'm, it's so nice to hear it firsthand uh, and and how it does alleviate anxiety and and you don't have to worry about the power anymore. Yeah. And that's uh, that's 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 our contribution. So you know, so happy to to do that. Um, I love hearing that. And then the other thing of it for me is that it's something that now has become part of uh, the teaching of the bus, you know, and that's something I'm really looking forward to getting, you know, deeper into. Like we would certainly, unless somebody asks, we like, we would not previously have talked about our, you know, power, um, set up probably just for all the reasons that Jeff said, but, um, you know, I guess starting with the display that's here where you can monitor everything that's going on, it's beautiful. Um, you know, it's front and center, but I think, you know, it's really in line with the values of the Lennon bus with the sustainability and having that be part of the experience of coming on board the bus. Um, yeah, it's something the crew doesn't have to think about in terms of being anxious, but it becomes part of the Lennon bus experience to talk about it. So I'm, I'm just really into that as well, because we may be inspiring kids to want to go into your business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really cool, too. Music and electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. hand it worked for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Brian and Jeff, thank you so much for letting me on the bus and letting us into this project and for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to the Limitless Energy podcast. Be sure to subscribe on any of your favorite podcast platforms.